Hi everyone, I'm Jason A. Cherry, author of Pittsburgh's Lost Outpost, Captain Trent's Fort, and I'm here at Braddock Battlefield History Center to commemorate a most important and almost often overlooked event in the young history of Pittsburgh. And when I talk about the young history of Pittsburgh, we're all familiar especially with the French and Indian War, is what it was called here in the colonies, or globally when it was called the Seven Years' War. But in the sort of wilderness uh, backcountry of what we know today as Western Pennsylvania, um, we first hear about the opening shots by a most important event that sort of put a young Virginian on the map, a 21-year-old George Washington. And at this uh, rocky bower that he and some Virginians uh, attacked in the early morning of May the 28th, 1754, we often hear that this is what sets, as someone would put, uh, in the back country of America set the world on fire. But we want to actually are here today to commemorate an event in Pittsburgh that sort of set the sparks or laid the uh, foundation and set the pieces in motion for what later would put George Washington on the map and many other future founding fathers. And we start by on this day, April 17th, 1754. And you got to picture what this place would look like. Just 10 minutes from where I stand today, down the Monongahela River where it converged with the Allegheny River to form the Ohio River, a triangular piece of land known as the Forks of the Ohio. And at this piece of land is set a collision course for three worlds, the French, the British, and the indigenous. And at this point, everyone is vying for, to take possession of this triangular piece of land. Now the French sort of won the battle, so to speak, as they began building in the summer of 1753, building forts at Fort Presque Isle, Fort LeBeouf, and then an outpost at Venango. But the British also had ideas. The king realizing that the French were trespassing, apparently on uh, what he said sovereigns of Great Britain, began to urge Virginia governor, Lieutenant Governor Robert Dinwiddie, to hopefully send out a force to begin building an outpost here. And they began almost two months from this day on February 17, 1754. And the supervisor of this, of this area at the Forks of the Ohio, or what we know today as the city of Pittsburgh, was a veteran of the King George's War, uh, the War of Austrian Secession, or what it was called in the colonies as King George's War. Uh, William Trent, a backcountry merchant and partner of one of the uh, most well-known uh, merchant firms in all of the 13 colonies. And William Trent began recruiting men. He returned backwoodsmen, sawyers, carpenters, and began an outpost uh, building a storehouse at the mouth of Redstone Creek, about 37 miles on the Monongahela from the Forks of the Ohio, today at the uh, present site of Brownsville, Pennsylvania. And he began in February 17th having a treaty with the uh, indigenous population showing them that they wish to build a outpost to protect their families and also to settle in the region. And Trent wisely knew for over this sense of two months that the indigenous were key to taking control of this area. So William Trent decided to have Tenarison or the half king lay the first log of this outpost. And they began building what they called an advanced house or magazine. Uh, right there at the, what they call today, the point. And at the Forks of the Ohio, they began building, building not only a storehouse or magazine for their supplies, but also a second building uh, to further build on. And they also began to uh, lay out the groundwork for the fort. Now on July 25th, 1753, the Ohio Company, the employer of William Trent and the rest of these backwoodsmen that are at the Ohio, they decided to lay out a plan to build a fort 90 feet square with 12 foot high walls. Now this plan was proposedly almost scrapped initially because their site of the fort about three or four miles down the Ohio River at the mouth of Chartiers Creek was deemed sort of not possible to build such an outpost. But Trent, seeking the help of Tenarison, actually came back to the Forks of the Ohio, viewed it in August of 1753, and realized this was the ideal place for a fort. And as George Washington would later write uh, in November of 1753, he would also say that this place had almost absolute command of both rivers. 
And so Trent began laying out the groundwork by laying this fort out, 90 feet square, pounding in stakes to sort of lay the square out. Eventually, the proposed plans were 16 feet bastions in each corner of, these, of this square. And Trent began not only uh, supplying the indigenous that were locally to the area, but also uh, helping to eventually send the word out um, to most people to come help there at the Forks of the Ohio. And as Trent, who had at this point had about 70 or 80 men at the Forks of the Ohio uh, building, was waiting on a, another such person to aid him and help guard the workmen. And this man that he uh, was also considered uh, his sort of equal at the Forks of the Ohio was the young Colonel George Washington. Uh, Colonel Washington was actually commissioned uh, on January 25th, 1754. Trent was a day later, January 26, 1754. And so Trent waited patiently as he spent almost a month a building, laying out the storehouse. In fact, the French spies would later come on March the 6th, 1754 and report back to Logstown that they could see the uh, fort and stakes were mapped out but also an advanced house or what they believed was a magazine uh, being laid out there at the forks, but they weren't sure exactly because it was just laid out. So they began building, but as Trent began further uh, building this type of outpost and, and eventually uh, making it uh, as protection for not only the proposed settlers that are, could come to the Forks of the Ohio, but also the indigenous, uh, rumors were coming in. And at this time for rumors, Trent was hearing that the French would be down any day. And each day more itinerants were coming in to further tell him that there were people coming or the French were coming down the river, possibly the Ohio or what we know today is the Allegheny River, uh, coming from their outpost there at Venango. So Trent sent word to Colonel Washington. And Washington at the time uh, was in Alexandria, Virginia, doing the same thing that Trent did as trying to uh, recruit men to join Trent at the Forks of the Ohio. Unfortunately, Washington was having trouble. And at one point he wrote that he'd only got, garnered about 25 men because these men of Virginia, as he said, were loose idle persons of destitute house and home. Trent would eventually aid in more, after the 70 or 80 men, he would send out word to more recruits, hopefully joining more men there at the Forks to aid in building his outpost. Waiting each day, he sent for Mr. Giss to hopefully write to George Washington. George Washington would write back saying he would be there in possibly a week or so. George Washington waited. It was almost the first or second week of March. He was still stuck in Virginia. Trent, realizing that George Washington was being delayed, decided it was better to head to hopefully the what he called the inhabitants or at the mouth of Wills Creek and go to the Ohio Company warehouse to not only get more supplies, which had been uh, needed replenished, uh, from the indigenous coming in and the, and the men working uh, day in and day out. Um, so Trent decided to meet with uh, two of the Indians uh, in the area of the Forks of the Ohio. He met with Tanarson or the Half King, and he met with uh, Scar Riotti. And both of them, he sat and made a plan for defensive. He realized, and this was right before he left on March the 17th, 1754, that it was best to lay a defensive plan. In order to lay a defensive plan, they needed to hopefully have some kind of thing for the men to do if he in fact left and before the French came down the river. So Trent looked at the large uh, plentiful things of timber that were still in the area. And he inquired about Ensign Edward Ward, a half brother of George Crohan, another local trader and former partner of William Trent. And he told him that he would proceed to hurry up George Washington at the mouth of Wills Creek, right at the North Branch of the Potomac, gather more supplies, more recruits, and eventually meet back at the Forks of the Ohio. So on March the 17th, 1754, Trent left and headed back to, the, to Wills Creek. He arrived there 10 days later on March 27th, 1754, and Washington wasn't there. Writing to Washington, Washington said it would be almost seven or eight days until the wagons could arrive. Trent 
proceeded to recruit more recruits, send them on to the Forks of the Ohio. By April the 12th, 1754, they had at least 52 men uh, under the employment of the Ohio Company. So why do you ask why did Trent was able to garner such a man when Washington had trouble? Well, Washington was charging the soldiery late of eight pence per day. Whereas Trent believed that these men of the Ohio Company, of which their employer, uh, meaning Lieutenant Governor Robert Dinwiddie, who was also a prominent member of this uh, land speculating company. Trent realized that in order to do so, they would, he could pay them the volunteer rate, which his first raised troops uh, was similar to when he was in King George's War in 1746. So he paid the men two shillings a day, almost three times the rate that George Washington charged his men in Virginia. And by doing so, Trent didn't have any issue getting men to come to the Forks of the Ohio. But at this point, with the uncertainty going on at the Forks and Trent still waiting around for George Washington, Ward realized he would have to put up a thing of defensive at this point. So he had the men start uh, laying out and using the excess timber that was laying in the region to hopefully protect the two buildings that were being built at this point. But by April 12, 1754, Ward would actually receive a letter from John Davidson of Logstown saying that the, Trent would, that the men would be here in almost four days, meaning the French. Realizing that this could happen, Ensign Ward rode a day to about not even up to the mouth of Turtle Creek, about not even a mile from where I stand today. And at the mouth of Turtle Creek was the cabin of John Frazier, Trent's second in command. Lieutenant John Frazier was also a fur trader, and at his cabin here at the mouth of Turtle Creek, Ward pleaded with him to come join him at the Forks of the Ohio to hopefully uh, settle the inevitable in case the French, if the reports were true and the French did come down the Allegheny River. But Frazier unfortunately refused to do so, not parting from his business, telling Ward that he had a penny to lose for a shilling and that he had business that he couldn't be ended in under six days. So Ward realized without Frazier's help, he would have to do it himself. So the young ensign returned back to the Forks of the Ohio and started uh, even more quickly pacing his defensive position. And by doing so, Trent would later write, Ward would have less than almost 50 men uh, up to those remaining three or four days before the French would come down the river. And at this thing, French, Trent would say that the French would actually have about 500 men with about nine pieces of cannon. And he realized that in order to do so, he ordered Ward to hopefully dig sort of entrenchments around these two buildings, saying he laid one horizontal log completely around their framework of what they had already built up to this point. Ward also began on the day of April 16, 1754, putting up basically pickets or palisades, as he put it, to surround the entire of the buildings in front of these horizontal logs. What he didn't realize, or what Ensign Ward didn't realize, is that night on the April 16th, about three miles up the Allegheny River, the French had landed at the Lenape village of Shinopinstown. Shinopinstown today is about three miles north of the, the point or the, or the uh, Point State Park today and lies about where 30th Street is today or by the 30, 31st Street Bridge. And at this village, their commander, Claude Pierre Conchicourt, drafted a summons who he believed was William Trent. So on the night of April 16th, 1754, Conchicourt drafted a summons that he was going to uh, give to the commander, Captain William Trent, the next day. So that afternoon, as Ward was finishing up the pickets and hanging the gate door to the Palisades, they realized that the French were almost here. For at, as Ward would write later, he could see up the Ohio or Allegheny River we know today and see the bateaus coming down the river. Ward would write that they would land 300 yards from where they had the fort laid out, almost a, as he would put it, they would march closer to within a musket shot of where they stood. And Ward and his men, now reduced to almost 
less than 50, about Ward would write, there would be about 41 men, only 33 effective or with weapons. And the French would start cadencing two drums, as of which Ward would leave the Palisades with the half king and proceed to accept the terms from Captain Francois Le Mercier. And Le Mercier would hand him and say he had one hour to do so. Le Mercier would write that it was two o'clock in the afternoon and that he should take no longer than one hour. Ward was in such a predicament at this point because with his commander, William Trent, still stuck at the mouth of Wills Creek waiting on Washington, here he was with 33 men that were actually with weapons and didn't actually know what to do. The half king suggested that they should delay and say he must wait for his actual commanding officer to return. Hopefully that that would stall at least enough to do so. Ward took about a half hour contemplating over this and decided he should do so. And by doing so, he went back to the commander, Francois Mercier, and said to him that he was not an officer of rank to accept such terms and that we must wait on their commanding officer, meaning Trent. Unfortunately, the French were not buying this and they decided to that they had would have to leave the very next day by noon at the latest, or the bateaus and uh, artillery would blow them up from the water. Ward, realizing what predicament he was in, decided on that day, which is why we commence, commemorate today, April 17, 1754, and decided that he had no choice. As much as he would put that he wanted to defend this to the last extremity, they were outnumbered almost 12 to one. So Ward the next morning by noon decided to leave and headed up, uh, leaving the forks of the Ohio and headed back to their storehouse at the mouth of Redstone Creek, 37 miles away. But there wasn't all that everyone that left, the half king or Tenarison, stormed greatly at the French and pleaded with them, saying that they had no right to take over such an outpost because he himself laid the first log. We would later find out in November of 1754 that the half king, in fact, it was involved with the scuffle with uh, Captain Francois Mercier and actually shoved the officer to the ground, as of which it was later written uh, by an, a, an unknown Indian at the time at an Indian treaty at Wills Creek in November of 1754, that if there were any person of leadership such as Trent that day or when that morning when the half king shoved the French officer to the ground, they would have not left a Frenchman alive, according to this Indian. So as we look at this aftermath, the blood was boiling for the half king. And as he already in the summer had been called a child by the French when he proceeded to go north to tell them that they were invading on English land. And then involved in a scuffle on April 18th, 1754. We realized the starting to reach ahead, so to speak, when it came to uh, aggression and hostility towards the French. Now there weren't any shots fired that day. And sadly, as, as Trent would get word from his itinerant James Foley that uh, Ward and his men had to accept a surrender at the uh, Forks of the Ohio. This would basically set the staging ground for what this began led up to what we know today as the French and Indian War, or globally as the Seven Years' War. And it started to not only inspire Virginia, but also Pennsylvania for after this day that we commemorate today on April 17, 1754, word got out of it and spread to the colonies. Washington would send word with Edward Ward to Williamsburg. Governor Dinwiddie would send word to all the governors of the colonies. But a Philadelphia printer, Benjamin Franklin, would receive word of this, hearing about Trent's men and Edward Ward uh, surrendering to the French, and it inspired him to write to London agent Richard Partridge on May the 8th, 1754. And by doing so, he included that in order for, for all of them to stand together, they must all join or die. 
And at the bottom of this letter, he concocted a political cartoon, a picture of a head of a snake followed by other pieces, which each name the colony designated to each piece. This, of course, is the infamous join or die cartoon that became not only the rallying cry or political cartoon for the Seven Years' War, but almost 20 years later for uh, the Americans or patriots as they tried to fight against tyranny in the American Revolution. So as we realize how important it is as such an overlooked event uh, on today of April 17th, we realize that here right in Pittsburgh, that not only was this the staging ground for what would later be, be the French and Indian War, it would also provide the sparks that would eventually put George Washington on the map and eventually become father of our country. So as we sort of look back at this day and, and realize uh, in this young sort of history of Pittsburgh, we have to realize that, yes, right here in this city that we all know and love, Pittsburgh became not only the birthplace of the nation's first political cartoon, but also the sort of, as you could say, platform for as what Winston Churchill would call America's First World War. Thank you.